In 1915, these beaches at Gallipoli in Turkey were the scene of one of the world's most infamous military disasters, a catastrophe that epitomizes the horrors of World War I. To live, to work, to fight in Gallipoli was to experience the very worst that the First World War could ever give you. The Gallipoli defeat has been blamed on bungling in London and on the ground. The whole campaign a humiliating failure that Britain has tried to forget. British probably think this is a defeat, so they don't want to remember it. But new analysis suggests the Gallipoli disaster was down to something much more fundamental than bad leadership. Could it be that the whole campaign was lost even before the first soldiers landed? In 1915, the Allies were struggling on the Western Front and turned their attention east. One of their targets was the Ottoman Empire, modern-day Turkey. The battlefields of Gallipoli are little changed in more than 80 years. The eight-month struggle of the British, French and Anzac forces against the Turks would leave a quarter of a million casualties. The Allies withdrew, having achieved nothing. This failure has been blamed on poor leadership and lack of support from London. But is this the only reason why Gallipoli was such a catastrophe? Peter Doyle is a geologist who has looked for answers to this question in the landscape. What he has found has convinced him no amount of leadership could have saved such a flawed campaign. There wasn't just one enemy here. The British and the Allies were fighting not only the Turks, they were fighting the terrain, and the terrain was an enemy that they had to fight, and it was probably on an unequal terms. Peter Doyle has come back to the battlefield to search for more evidence of how the terrain determined the uniquely awful nature of the Gallipoli tragedy. See all those artifacts from the battlefields, from their farms, from their own farm field. This is a harvest from their own fields. Hand grenades. A Turkish and a British canteen side by side. This is a, a British 18 pounder shell. It's been on fire. It's still live, but it's full of shrapnel balls. How many years did it take? He has been harvesting, and every year something comes out. Every time the tractor goes for corn, for sunflowers. These are pieces of naval shell. Incredibly high caliber very thick shell. Imagine this being used against human beings, breaking up, fragmenting. Gallipoli is known as a land campaign, but evidence of its origins lies in the waters of the Dardanelles. Savas Caracas is a diver. His grandfather fought at Gallipoli for Turkey. Now he is driven to find the underwater remains of this tragic episode. I've been diving around Gallipoli for the last three, four years, making an expedition to find what is left behind from the Gallipoli campaign. 30 meters down in the clear waters of the Dardanelles are the wrecks of battleships from a forgotten engagement. HMS Triumph, HMS Majestic, HMS Ocean. Names from the dreadnought era when Britain ruled the waves. For me, this is all a naval campaign. Everything started in the sea and everything finished in these waters. That's why I dive here and I go back to 1915 in the sea. The Gallipoli disaster began as the audacious big idea of one man. First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill. His plan was to use the Navy to knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war by threatening its capital, Constantinople. The campaign would also release the Russian fleet from the Black Sea. But the narrow Dardanelles Straits were controlled by Turkish guns and mines. On the 18th of March, 1915, the Allied navies tried to break through the channel, but, to Churchill's dismay, they failed. On the seafloor today lie the three Allied battleships lost to Turkish mines that day. Their guns lie silent now, but their explosives are still lethal. 
down there are the 12 inch shells they place them into the gun and then they take those cordites and place them after the shell and close it and fire it this cordite has been underwater for over 80 years but it still ignites the striking thing about the 18th of march is that huge armada big battleships coming to force the dardanelles were stopped and then the hopes of the British Navy and British forces went down and the hopes of Turkish forces went all the way up. But Churchill was not to be stopped. He was sure that army units landed on the peninsula could quickly capture the guns and make the Dardanelles Straits safe for the Navy. Secretary of War Lord Kitchener was far from convinced. Reluctantly, he agreed to commit troops to this new plan. Now there were just five weeks to prepare the first amphibious landing against a defended beachhead in military history. And it would take place a thousand miles from London. Turkish authorities quickly learnt of the Allied plan and began to prepare their country's defences. So how much did the Allies actually know about the place they were about to invade? If you're going to land on Gallipoli, what you need to know is how are you going to get your men ashore? And where are you going to get your men ashore? And one of the most important things is to imagine taking thousands of men ashore under fire. Where's that fire going to be coming from? Where's it going to be located? You need to know scientifically how the terrain is going to advantage the defender. And in this case, terrain absolutely advantages the defender. Aerial surveillance was primitive, so to supplement this, Military officers made sketches of the coastline from the sea. This is the kind of drawing that was carried out and that the officers were trained, military officers and naval officers were trained to draw. So on this map, we have defended positions, fort and wire entanglements. We have gentle slopes to ridge, picking out terrain elements. But it is what they don't show that would prove fatal. You can't see machine guns from this. You can't see the amount of trenches there are in this forward slope and in the reverse slope. You can't see forts in the, in the background and you can't see guns. So these drawings, beautiful as they are, accurate as they are, are not something that you can really trust to land hundreds of men on a defended shore. But trust in them, the military planners did. At dawn on April the 25th, 1915, more than 11,000 men of the British and Anzac forces prepared to land on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Anzac forces would land in the north, while the British would take five beaches at the toe of the peninsula. The objective for day one was to reach the high ground of Maltepe for the Anzacs and Achibaba for the British. Then they would assault the narrows and silence the guns, clearing the way for the navy. W Beach would be assaulted by 900 Lancashire Fusiliers. What they didn't realize was how much the terrain of this chosen landing would favor the defending Turks. This is W Beach, the classic Lancashire landing. And you can see it, the cliffs on either side, the cliffs which were manned by Turks in their trenches, perfectly positioned for the offensive. At 6 a.m., after a naval bombardment, the troops were towed to the beaches in a string of lifeboats. Almost certainly, the tension would have risen as they saw the headland coming in, and they became more and more anxious. What was going to be happening? Would they have extinguished the fences? Would they land unopposed? What was it going to be like? 200 yards offshore, the boats were released. They started to row. All was quiet. And still, nothing was happening, complete silence. And then with just 50 yards to go, suddenly this massive explosion of energy. A hail of gunfire killed men jammed in the boats. Others were cut down in the water. Many dropped their rifles into the sea and sand, jamming their weapons. The tension, the release of the battle, trying to get forward, trying to find cover, realizing your rifle couldn't fire, what could you do about it? Do you pick up another one? Do you clean it? Do you just throw it away and concentrate on getting up the hut so you can get the close grips with the Turks? So exposed was the beach that the smallest scrape in the sand could make the difference between life and death. Imagine it, getting into the sand and digging a shallow scrape like this in order to get deep, to get into the sand to cover yourself. 
even by ducking down, there's no way you could avoid fire from the tops of those cliffs. Almost immediately, they were trapped in the open by a formidable obstacle. The whole of this beach was covered with two massive emplacements, crisscrossed with wires. Barbed wire was surely no surprise. So why did it stop them in their tracks? The evidence can be found on the beaches today. This is Turkish barbed wire. This has an incredibly tough core built out of a square section. And just imagine trying to cut this. A really quite a physical force. And it's incredibly tough to try and do this. Practically impossible. <laughs> on the clifftop, it's easy to see how the Turks used the landscape to funnel men into their field of fire. You see, here we are, just approaching the right hand of the cliff top. You can see, actually, the, the tracings of the trench line. What's just interesting to see is the way the trenches followed the line of the, the ridge top. They're contouring it, they're following it around. So as the troops are drawn into it, of course, I guess the fire is then being concentrated and their trench line follows that exactly. You're, you're drawing them into a net, into a trap. That trap caused over 400 casualties for the Lancashire Fusiliers. The only way out was up the cliffs. Oh, look, there's a bit of shell. Yeah, a bit of shell fragment or something. The battlefields of Gallipoli are littered with far more than shell fragments. It looks like a bone. Is it human? I think so. People have been finding bones for decades, really. They just turn up, and it shows the number of bodies that have actually just been left here after the campaign. It's very easy to forget just what devastation uh, both shell fire, but concentrated rifle and machine gun fire could do on a human body, ripping it apart. As a geologist, I'm thinking, well, why land here? You've got these steep cliffs, you've got this narrow beach, you've got the beach being funneled into a gorge. It just seems ultimate madness. The madness was repeated at V Beach, two miles to the south. This was the largest of the landings, with almost 3,000 men using open boats and an old collier called the River Clyde. The boats ran aground to a devastatingly accurate barrage of gunfire. The open boats there, the troops were just beginning to get out, was completely devastated. They started falling into the water, they started running forward. Some of the boats started to be set on fire, they started to burn. The soldiers in the River Clyde were about to be funneled out onto narrow gangways at the very point where the Turkish fire was strongest. No one hesitated. It really was one of these moments which epitomizes the whole of the sacrifice, the, 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 the tragedy of Gallipoli itself. Less than half of the first wave, only 300 men managed to make it to the shore. But unlike W Beach, they survived the onslaught. A clue to why is in this original photograph taken from the River Clyde on that day. Enlarged, it clearly shows the dead and wounded on the pontoon, and on the shore, men sheltering behind a low sandbank. That sandbank still exists today. Here on the beach, it was this small and inconsequential piece of geology that saved people's lives. As the men came ashore, they huddled underneath this bank and unhitching their entrenching sills, digging into Mother Earth in order to crouch down to avoid the fire from behind them and over there in the ford. Really, it was this simple three feet of Earth which saved the lives of hundreds of men on that day. So just how heavy was the firepower the Allied forces faced? The Gallipoli landings took place at a military crossroads. Allied leadership and planning were still Victorian, but the weapons the troops faced were modern, and the most lethal was the machine gun. This is a British-made Maxim machine gun, essentially exactly the same design as the Maxims that the, the Turks were using, of German origin. During the Gallipoli campaign, it was ideal territory for machine gunners. These um, necks and gullies where soldiers advancing off the beach would have to be funneled through small gaps, so something like this could cause an absolutely uh, devastating amount of damage. Nothing would change the face of warfare quite as much as the machine gun. The best infantry soldier in 1915 could rapid fire a rifle 15 rounds a minute. The machine gun could fire 600 rounds a minute.
two or more machine guns in the confines of a beachhead could unleash over 1,200 bullets a minute. Even at this stage, machine guns are still placed on the flank and are firing so, yeah. across each other. Yeah. So instead of just catching one or two guys, one behind the other, you're, you're catching a whole swathe at a time. 600 rounds a minute, just belt after belt after belt, is going to cut a battalion to pieces. The landing at V Beach had failed. The sea was red with blood for 50 yards, and the beach would not be taken until the following day. Why were the troops so ill-prepared for the landings? Peter Doyle has pieced together the maps and intelligence that the British had available. He believes they offer clues to why things went so badly wrong. Okay, this is one of the original maps that they took with them. It was from this map that they launched the campaign. This map was an enlarged copy of a highly inaccurate map that had been drawn up some 60 years earlier. What few contours there were in the original became even less apparent in the enlargement. Now, when we look at those beaches, what we can see quite nicely is it's very empty, no contours. It doesn't seem to have any of the edges and slopes that we The contours are so sparse that some hills are missing entirely. But even more worrying was the lack of information on the Turkish defences. But they don't show uh, a vast number of the, of the trenches. They don't show the barbed wire entanglements. They don't show uh, the positions of machine guns. So for the men coming out of the boat, uh, they were almost totally unaware of what they were going into. Absolutely. When they, when they landed, they expected to see a very flat and featureless plain, instead of which they saw there was a range of other smaller hills in position, and those small hills, of course, were defended. Those heavily defended positions were incorporated in a new map drawn after the landings. Comparing this to the original map used before the landings reveals the shocking lack of intelligence the soldiers had. It reveals three previously unknown machine gun positions, extensive trench lines and barbed wire entanglements. It's incredible to look at it here. You could imagine devastating fire if they could pour fire down in from here into troops coming on onto the beaches. Kinan Çelik is a Turkish historian who maintains these beaches were defended by only a handful of men. This beach you know, was not uh, actually strongly held by Turkish army. So around here, overlooking this beach, there were just you know, 100 you know, guys. The Allies had expected to face an ill-disciplined conscript army. So how could a hundred Turkish troops pin down 3,000 highly trained British soldiers? They say when British started moving towards the beach, Turks were shooting. When they stopped landing, Turks stopped the fire. So very well organized and well you know, disciplined fire was coming you know, down on the British troops trying to land here. This evidence shows the Turks were not at all the ill-disciplined mob the British planners had expected. And there was one other factor that the Allied command had totally underestimated. So the main thing was mostly people were local people and knew the train very well and they were defending their own country, homeland. So they dug in. So this was the spirit of Turkish soldier. What else could they do? The spirit of a handful of Turkish defenders would also have a decisive effect 10 miles to the north. Here, bad luck would compound the bad maps as the Anzac forces landed in error at the worst possible place on the entire Gallipoli Peninsula. They thought they'd get up a nice, lazy ridge, which would take them to the promised land on the top of the ridge there. But they got a bit of a shock when they landed here. At Anzac, there was no slaughter on the beaches. The coastline was defended by just a handful of Turkish snipers hidden in the undergrowth. The Anzac troops just threw off their packs and stormed up into the hills. So they actually stuck to the undergrowth and the scrub, working their way forward, often using their bayonets. Bill Sellers is an Australian writer and historian who has studied the Anzac story. Many of the Australians never saw a Turkish soldier that first day, but they were under fire for most of that time. And there were snipers still hiding in this undergrowth for days. As they reached the heights of Pluggy's Plateau, the Australian soldiers got their first shock of the campaign. According to their maps, this plateau linked directly into the high ground. It doesn't. It stops here, drops down, and you get what became known in the campaign as the Razor's Edge. The Razor's Edge was a sheer ridge impossible to cross, which cut off the advancing troops from the high ground beyond. 
Now, I've got a touch of vertigo, and just looking over this cliff is yeah. a really, really frightening proposition. It's, it's a really steep drop. So you don't go too close, because sometimes undermined. To call it a razor's edge, it's absolutely a razor's edge, isn't it? Yeah. There is absolutely no way you could get any amount of troops over that. There just wasn't the route straight across that all through the first day, people thought, the senior officers thought existed. Just like the British at Cape Hellas, the Anzacs were let down by inadequate maps. And the map is a nonsense. You look at it, you think that there are very simple slopes, gentle terrain, with just a few ridges that could be scrambled up. And yet, the truth is very different. The truth is deeply incised ridges and valleys choked with undergrowth. So they had to recoil slightly, move around, then down through into the valleys, trying to work their way up to the high ground. But most of them got no further than that ridge line. That's as far as most of them ever got. That's where the, the front line got anchored. The Anzac forces became widely dispersed by the terrain. But at the front lines, they still heavily outnumbered the Turks. But the Turks had a trump card. They were defending their homeland. And at Anzac, they were inspired by the leadership of their young commander, Mustafa Kemal, who would go on to be Kemal Ataturk, leader of modern Turkey. This Turkish rifle with the bayonet fixed reminds me of the first Turkish troops that stopped the Anzac landing. There were not many Turks. The Anzacs were coming up to the high ground and Kemal, when he arrived there, he saw the Turkish troops fleeing. The first thing he said, if you don't have any mission, you have the bayonets. Fix the bayonets and lie down. And that moment, when the Anzacs saw this action, they also lie down, you know. This is the moment we won the whole battle. The Anzacs lost all momentum. They dug in, and what should have been a swift assault rapidly became static trench warfare. How could so few Turkish soldiers have stopped so many? The Turks had one huge advantage, their landscape. You can't imagine anybody trying to get up here, and it's hardly surprising the Turks didn't really want to commit too much to the defense of this. It's absolutely a clear example of why terrain is a, a magnificent munition of war. Day one at Gallipoli was a catastrophe. Churchill and his military planners in London had expected a quick surgical strike to clear the Dardanelles. But the Turks forced both Anzac forces and the British into pockets on the beaches where they stayed put. The Gallipoli campaign turned rapidly into just what the planners wanted to avoid, trench warfare. If they had been ill-prepared for the landings, they were totally unprepared for what now lay ahead. All supplies for 70,000 men trapped on the beaches had to be brought in by boat. W Beach became the nerve center for the British sector. The remains of the piers can still be seen today. And just offshore lie the remnants of the landing barges that failed to make it to the beaches. Perhaps in the waters of the Dardanelles lie more clues to the failure of the campaign. Unfired 303s. See? They're here. This is an amazing find, uh, because these aren't the, the ordinary Mark 7 infantry bullet, oh. the bullet that the most of the soldiers came ashore with. These are the earlier bullet, the bullet that was designed for a different rifle. That caused a problem, actually, on the, on the shore. Mixing the ammunition yeah. on the beaches, yeah. so many different. Gallipoli was a combined military operation. Yet at this stage, the army and navy used different guns and ammunition. These bullets are one small example of the lack of coordination that dogged the campaign. But once landed, why did the British advance inland grind to a halt? North of W Beach is Gully Ravine. On the maps it appeared a meandering stream, but actually it's a broken landscape that acted as an effective barrier for the movement of troops. Worse still, the men who had to travel up Gully Ravine to the front line were exposed to fire from the Turkish gunners positioned on Achi Baba. Even in Gully Ravine there was no protection from shell fire. The Turks were firing down the valleys, and particularly Gully Ravine. Battle casualties at Gallipoli were not primarily from bullets and machine guns, but from this lethal and random shell fire. The 
big wound causing agents isn't this. This is the bullet. About 29% of all casualties are caused by this. What they are injured by are these. And these are a bit confusing because that is a shrapnel ball. A ball which comes out of an exploding shell above your head. This is what's going to hit you. There's over 360 of these in every shell. And that is a shell fragment, sometimes called shrapnel. And there could be thousands of pieces, sometimes this size, sometimes microscopic, sometimes big enough to chop you in two. With the Turks occupying the high ground and with greater artillery power at their disposal, there was nowhere for the Allies to hide. So dangerous was it out in the open that the men hollowed shelters out of the hillsides. Evidence of one such shelter dug by the British at W Beach remains. It's amazing to reflect on the subterranean life that the soldiers had to lead with this solid rock roof and dug away into the soft earth walls they would have slept here, protecting them from the heat and protecting them from the shells. At Anzac it was even worse. The front line was so interwoven that men were exposed to fire from all sides. You can see there's this horseshoe effect on the front line. It, it rings around these ridges. And bullets fired over here, they may have been fired at the front line, but if they, they missed a target, they just come in and just bury themselves in here. I mean, a single bullet may have been a rifle bullet. Yeah. If you find a few studded together, it may have been a burst from the machine gun. I mean, you've got here, this is part of a, uh, a rifle clip. You can get an idea of how confusing it all is. is this is Australian, New Zealand held area, but the next ridge behind that was Turkish held. So the next one behind that was held by Australians, and further up it was held by Turkish troops. I mean, just this interlocking feeling of different lines behind each other. And um, I mean, nowhere was safe. I mean, you were as likely to be shot in the back as you were, were from the front. At Anzac, thousands of men lived and died, trapped in a claustrophobically small area. I mean, the whole area is only about 400 um, acres. The Allied command alone had 35,000 men crammed in here. Ringing them at times, he had 40,000 or more Turkish soldiers. Constantly under Turkish observation and artillery fire, the Anzacs were especially vulnerable. The Turks, having the high ground up here, they were actually able to fire down through Shrapnel Gully. And this is, this is the main thoroughfare for the troops, to bring up supplies and everything else. But during daylight, they were under constant fire. All the peculiarities of the landscape, the deeply incised terrain, the interwoven trench lines, and the lack of protection, made this an exceptionally psychologically stressful place to fight. Sniping was a terrible threat, as the Gallipoli terrain made concealment easy, and in such a limited space, a single marksman could have a devastating impact. A couple of well-trained snipers in a good position can disrupt a battalion advance, there is no doubt about it. But in Gallipoli, it had another purpose. The sniper in, in 1915 was there to demoralize the opposition. Whether it be a platoon commander popping his head over the parapet, or whether it was the Tommy going to the loo, or what, whatever. The sniper killed at random and added huge psychological pressure. But being a good shot was not enough for him to survive. Camouflage is probably the most important thing to the sniper, because when he's seen, he's, he's dead. So this then is the a typical sort of suit that a sniper would either make for himself or have available to him. Anything they would find in the local surroundings in order to stitch on and to break up their outline. Turkish snipers were so skillful that it took the ingenuity of an Australian sergeant to find a solution. We've got here a photograph of some Australian soldiers very early in 1915 with a periscope rifle that they've made. Now the purpose of the periscope rifle was very straightforward. It meant that you could actually snipe at the Turkish front line. So by a system of mirrors, it enabled you to fire over the top of the parapet without actually exposing your body and putting you at risk. Basically from the picture, um, I took certain measurements, um, roughly to scale as much as I could. Through the series of mirrors, uh, once they're adjusted, all lined up, you can actually get 
a fairly good sight picture. So let's see if we can make it work. Yep. Worried about the recoil of it. 303 round has got a lot of recoil when it's actually fired. In Gallipoli, this device would have been targeted at the Turkish front lines. <laughs> it works, it works. Yeah. We've proved that it does work and you can actually fire it. So it can be used effectively for what it was sort of made to do. The deeply incised terrain made advances over open ground suicidal. But it created a lethal new kind of warfare. Here, at the edge of the New Zealand lines, overlooked by Turkish positions only yards away, the ground has recently collapsed and revealed one of Anzac's most closely guarded secrets. This is a hole that's opened up on a, on a forestry track and it's, it's incredible. What you can see is there's two holes, one incredibly deep and another one here at a much more shallow angle. At Anzac, tunnelling became a way of fighting as well as sheltering. Incredibly, there were also incidents of fighting underground, of tunnel meeting tunnel, and also a, a stealth war. It's amazing. I'm entering a tunnel that was built 87 years ago, and I've gone back beneath the front lines of 1915, and it's still intact. Uh, I expected soft material, but this is really hard. They would have to use picks and smaller pick-like tools to get through this material. Just here, there's a weak... Tunneling at Anzac proved to be a highly effective way of fighting. The subterranean war soon became as hazardous as the war fought on the surface. It's possible these kinds of tunnels would have intercepted Turkish tunnels. A stealth war developed as both sides dug, rested, listened. Without warning, the enemy could break through into a tunnel from any direction. Another gallery. A cross gallery. A maze of tunnels. I wonder what this was like as men moving down the tunnels, perhaps having to slide into the side to let other men cross, maybe carrying heavy equipment, maybe bringing bags of explosive. And we can see here a shaft a shaft that's probably connected to a fighting tunnel where they may well have laid a mine underneath the Turkish lines ready to blow up that mine and take the Turkish lines to kingdom come. Anzac troops created miles of these interconnecting tunnels. They even constructed whole new trench lines and secretly advanced towards Turkish lines beneath the ground. Further down here at the south, they captured an entire ridge by just digging out underneath it uh, from their own lines, digging forward, and they, they grabbed an, a valley. Again, maybe an advance of 50, 70 metres. When Churchill envisaged the Gallipoli landings, he gave little thought to geology. But now the consequences of that failure would come to haunt him. Geology had meant the landings were difficult and fighting conditions tough, but it also meant something even worse. Gallipoli is made of limestone and sand. It's dry and wells are scarce. For the thousands of troops, trying to get enough water soon became a daily obsession. This well was sunk in 1915 by the British Royal Engineers to try and tap the groundwaters. Was it enough to solve their problems? A simple test will show how drinkable this water is. We put some of this silver nitrate in. There should be a strong reaction if this water is tainted with salt. And it is. This water is undrinkable. Drinking this water would lead to debilitation, maddening thirst. Men would want more and more water and they couldn't get it. At Anzac, the rocks don't have groundwater close to the surface. So this water tank was dragged from the beachhead to the front lines. It was filled with water transported from as far away as Egypt. And it was from tanks like this that men got their daily ration, which was very, very small, just a pint or so, in incredibly hot weather. Exactly how much water does it take to keep a soldier active in the field? We would say you'd need 20 litres of water per man, per day, in those conditions, just to maintain normal efficiency. 
And these people were living on a litre, maximum two litres per day. Water is the lifeblood of a military machine. The uses of water are many. Washing and shaving becomes absolutely critical in those areas of close confinement. That personal hygiene becomes absolutely crucial. The lack of water made personal hygiene almost impossible at Gallipoli, which was all the more crucial in circumstances where dead bodies were left to decompose in the open. Thousands lay unrecovered throughout the entire campaign. When a man who was shot in the morning, the corpse would bloat up and sometimes just explode. I and mean, the troops would actually shoot at the corpses just to try and blow the gas out of them, trying to get them to decompose more quickly in the sun. And the flies that would breed and feed off the corpses, you could not eat, you could not drink without being surrounded by flies. It was this combination of lack of water, rotting corpses and flies which created the conditions for the most debilitating feature of the Gallipoli campaign, disease, especially dysentery. Dysentery is an infection which gnaws into your bowels and as a consequence your very life essence oozes from you. When you have got the evidence of your condition all over your legs, all over your uniform, and you physically need to be helped on and off a latrine. This is psychologically extremely wearing. In Gallipoli, this is part of the problem. Poorly prepared latrines. Very difficult to dig, very difficult to dig in the right place. Particularly when the dysentery came along, these were filled up rapidly, which then meant they had to redig them. And eventually they were digging foul ground, that which had been used before. By July 1915, the troops had been here for three months. With summer temperatures in the 30s, the lack of water became critical. The troops lived in such squalor that soon even more men were falling sick than were being injured in the fighting. You had men who would land here and maybe 12 stone, and within six weeks they were down to eight stone through dysentery. Men would somehow get to these latrines, men would fall in and they would drown in these latrines, and their friends would not have the strength to even pull them out. And yet, by Gallipoli standards, if you could hold a rifle, you were fit for frontline service. Winston Churchill's ambitious plan to knock Turkey quickly out of the war had become a pointless stalemate that was draining the Allies of men and money. But when in August they tried to break out of this stalemate, it was yet another disaster and the basis for one of the most enduring myths of the whole Gallipoli tragedy. A major August offensive was launched to break the stalemate, but it would be a minor diversionary attack by the Australian light horse at the Neck that has become the heart of an Anzac myth. The Neck is a ridge on the Anzac front line within 10 yards of the Turkish trenches. There were about eight Turkish trenches at the neck and then two machine guns uh, fixed on top of the hill. This is a narrow ridge line. It's as wide as three tennis courts side by side and if you can imagine the front line trenches are the base lines. The Royal Navy bombarded the Turkish defences throughout the nights before the attack. According to myth, a failure to synchronise watches between the British and the Australians meant the barrage stopped early. Seven minutes before the attack was due to go in, according to the watches of the Australian officers, the supporting bombardment stopped. The Australian infantrymen, who didn't dare leave their trenches for fear of another bombardment, waited. The Turks had time to set up their machine guns, but they were already well aware of the Australian intentions. Before the Australians' uh, trenches, there were barbed wire, and it was taken away. So the Turks knew there was an attack imminent coming. 4.30 a.m., the first wave of Australians prepared to attack. First line, mounted the fire steps, went over. And almost to a man, massacred. Few got more than five yards. Attempts made to stop the attack were in vain. Two more lines, another 300 men, leapt out of a trench, shoulder to shoulder, and were scythed down. As far as casualties are concerned, it was worse than the charge of the Light Brigade in the Crimean War. They lost two-thirds of the, of the men. 
It was sheer massacre. Myth has it that a British officer ordered the final waves of men to their death. It wasn't the case. It was an Australian officer. Later went on to be a Brigadier General. So it was a local massacre, born and bred. Almost 300 men died in 15 minutes. It would be another three years before their remains were finally buried at the Neck, where the memorial stands today. In Western France, losing one mile or two miles wouldn't make any difference. But in Gallipoli, every inch of land was competed. As the British were finding out further south, after months of bitter fighting, they were still only four miles from the beaches where they had landed. So we find ourselves here on the top of Gully Spur, four to four and a half miles from the beaches, which you can see clearly behind us there. And this was the deepest point the British reached at Cape Helles. And it took them from the 25th of April till the 28th of June to get to this point. This point was still three miles short of what had been their objective for day one, Achi Baba. So you can see clearly from up here, from the Helles beaches all the way up to Achi Baba, sitting over there, the objective for the 29th Division on the first day, supposed to be taken by nightfall on the 25th of April, never taken at all. Achi Baba became a symbol for the British forces. As long as it loomed over the horizon, it was a constant reminder of the campaign's failure. Peter Doyle decided to investigate what they would have seen had they reached it. I've just reached an objective, an objective that the British had on the first day, but which they never reached within eight months of the campaign. Because where I'm standing is Alchi Tepe, the hill known to the British as Achi Baba. Achi Baba was assumed to have commanding views over the Narrows. If the British had achieved it, would victory have been within their grasp? And when you look in the Dardanelles, what you see is the, the straits, the entrance to the Dardanelles. But what you can't see are the narrows, and it's the narrows where the guns protecting the minefields were located. The whole purpose, the whole point of trying to get to this fortress was to be able to direct fire into the narrows and to destroy those, to allow the ships to sail through and onto Istanbul. Achi Baba does not have views over the defences at the narrows. But what it does have is a commanding view of the British positions at the beaches. Terrain was a weapon of war that the Turks used against the attacking forces. It meant that the British, as they landed, were disadvantaged. They couldn't move over slopes. They couldn't drink the water. They could not see the targets and the objectives that they wanted to achieve. In my view, as a geologist, terrain won the battle for the Turks and lost it for the British. With the failure of the August offensive, London began to lose faith in the Dardanelles campaign. Lord Kitchener came to Gallipoli in November and saw with his own eyes the hopelessness of the position. He recommended withdrawal and London agreed. Churchill resigned from the government. The Gallipoli disaster would haunt him for the rest of his life. Today in Gallipoli, even 80 years of ploughing have failed to fully eradicate the evidence of this bitter struggle. Look, in five minutes, this is what we found, evidence of the British occupation. And less frequently, you're also finding, as you see, pieces of bone as well, lying on the top of the fields, still being found today. The Gallipoli campaign is perceived as a close-run thing, and victory was just within grasp. But could any amount of leadership and luck have saved this doomed military adventure? From the very beginning of the campaign, there was no chance. It was a hopeless endeavor, and it does not detract from the courage of the men, the bravery of those who came here, those who tried to see it through. And, and for us, looking at it today, these are the lessons that we should draw. The story that is always told of Gallipoli is of how the Allies failed. But there's another story, too that of a resounding Turkish victory. Full credit must go here at Gallipoli to the fact that the Turks beat the Allied forces. This was not a campaign that we lost by sleight of hand. It's not a question of saying we was robbed. This was a clear defeat. And the Allied forces in the end showed that this was a great Turkish victory.
the Gallipoli campaign started in the waters of the Dardanelles, and it would end there. The boats that landed the troops returned to evacuate them. When the last man departed in January 1916, they left behind a landscape strewn with thousands of dead. Allies lay with Turks. Today, many still lie unmarked in the landscape they fought and died for. When you come here and you absorb the landscape, everywhere you go around them, there is a feeling in Gallipoli. You can get it in the cemeteries, you can find it in the sunflowers. Everywhere you go, this sense of tragedy, this sense of hopelessness seeps out of the soil. It really is probably the most moving battlefield that I've ever visited. All the hills have names and stories, so it's like a sacred country. If you know what happened here, you feel this and you understand the futility of the, of the war. The Allied soldiers who landed at Gallipoli were set an impossible task. The Turkish army and the landscape itself were an unbeatable combination. No amount of leadership or planning could have defeated them.